Hello, everyone. We are very excited to welcome the over 650 people who registered for this webinar. What does AB 506 mean for you or you serving nonprofit? My name is Soleil Delgadillo, and I am the Volunteer and Community Engagement Manager at the Children's Institute. I am excited to be your moderator for this important topic. I'd love to highlight the wonderful volunteer committee who helped establish this webinar and our anonymous volunteers. Shout out to Cal Nonprofits who worked with the ACLU and child advocacy organizations on drafting amendments to AB 506 as it made its way through the legislative process. So before we get started, um, just some general housekeeping Zoom information. Um, this is a large meeting format slightly casual. Uh, video is optional, but we would love to see you. Participation is very much welcomed. Feel free to use the chat box and emojis throughout. Please be respectful of all speakers and attendees. Remember, we're volunteers as well. And we'll answer any questions at the end. So here is the agenda for today. Um, we will go over the basics of AB 506. We will talk about adjustment efforts. We'll go over an insurance perspective. We will talk about an implementation, implementation case study. And then lastly, what more do we need to do to implement this? And that is where we'll answer questions. But before we begin, we're gonna launch a poll question. So if folks can please answer the poll and we will give about 10 seconds. Awesome, we are almost there. We are at 78, 80% participation. Let's get to 100%. We're almost there, 84. And I'll do a countdown in five, four, three, two, and one. Carsey, if you can share the results, please. So thank you all for coming. It looks like the majority of folks didn't know this even existed. Um, the second is I had heard about it, but didn't know anything about it. Um, and then the rest follows, you all can see, but Great, we, we formed this committee in hopes to um, shed some light. Thank you. Okay. So why are we here today? Um, well, we're here together to understand how to implement this bill. In forming this committee, it was clear that the motivation behind the bill is necessary. However, it has been a challenge to implement it. And so today we're working with our elected officials to support and make this process better for all Californians. So we're gonna launch our second poll. And Carsey, if you can launch that, please. And again, if we can get 100% participation, please answer the poll. And I will give about 10 seconds. And so the question is, does your organization already have a background check process in place? Awesome, we are at 80% participation. Let's get those numbers up a little bit more. We're at 85, let's get to 90. We're at 86%. And we will close the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. And if you can share the results. So the majority of you said, yes, we require fingerprint-based background checks. The second uh, most answer is yes, we require personal information based on background. So this is really helpful to know. And thank you. So next, we will start with our first awesome speaker, um, Kristen Anderson. She is an attorney with the law firm for nonprofits, which provides a full range of legal services to nonprofits. 
In her practice, Kristen focuses on the nuances of tax exemption, nonprofit corporation law, and other legal matters that specifically affect nonprofit organizations. The law firm for nonprofits is passionate about helping nonprofits start and grow their organizations and programs. Um, if you all can give emoji hello, welcome Kristen. Um, Kristen, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Soleil. Um, I'm going to go over the basics of AB 506. Um, as Soleil mentioned, it's been a bit of a challenge for some organizations to implement. The process is required by AB 506. And part of that is due to the fact that the language contained in AB 506 is not very precise. So it's hard to interpret some of the requirements. Um, AB 506 is aimed at youth service organizations, and it imposes requirements related to training, background checks, and policies for child abuse prevention. So what constitutes a youth service organization? Um, in the AB 506 language, the definition is that as an organization that employs or utilizes the services of individuals that due to the relationship with the organization are mandated reporters as defined in a specific subsection of the penal code. The specific subsection of the penal code states that mandated reporters include administrators and employees of youth organizations. So that definition itself is circular. Essentially, it says a youth, organ youth service organization is an organization that employs administrators and employees of youth organi organizations. Um, so it, it's a bit open to a bit of, of interpretation, uh, but based on previously existing laws, um, it would essentially apply to any business that uh, provides services to minors. Um, so we're talking about camps, churches, scouting programs, uh, youth sports organizations, mentoring programs, and other uh, youth serving type organizations. So who does AB 506 apply to? It implies to the administrators, employees, and regular volunteers of these youth services organizations. And a regular volunteer is any volunteer who is 18 years or older and who has direct contact with or supervision with children for more than 16 hours per month or 36 hours per year, or sorry, 32 hours per year. So how does a youth service organization comply with the requirements of AB 506? Well, first, it requires that the employees and regular volunteers of the youth services organization complete training in child abuse and neglect reporting. Um, this requirement can be met by completing an online mandated reporter training that is available through the Office of Child Abuse Prevention in the California State Department of Social Services. Um, it requires that the organization conduct background checks on all employees and regular volunteers and exclude from participation any individual that has a history of child abuse. And it also requires organizations to develop and implement child abuse prevention policies and procedures. Uh, the policies and procedures are required to include policies to ensure that the regular volunteers and employees are reporting incidents of suspected child abuse um, and also requires that to the greatest extent possible, there's uh, at least two mandated reporters present whenever administrators, employees, or volunteers are in contact with or supervising children. So essentially, there need to be two adults present whenever um, anyone involved in the organization is in contact with children. So what type of background che uh, checks meet this criteria? Um, most organizations have some sort of background check in place, um, but AB 506 requires a specific type of background check um, that is in compliance with Penal Code 11105.3. So essentially, the organization needs to request all convictions or arrests pending adjudication from the California Department of Justice. And it also requires fingerprinting through the use of a form approved by the DOJ or through LifeScan. Um, one other thing that is included in AB 506 is that an insurer uh, may request information from an organization ensuring that they're complying with AB 506 before they write their liability insurance for the organization. Um, but I will let Fred get into that in more detail later on in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, so much for shedding a little bit more on this bill. So now um, we are going to hear from Assembly Member Adreen Nazarian um, from the 46th District. So Assembly Member Adreen Nazarian was elected to the California State Assembly in November of 2012 to represent California's newly drawn 46th Assembly District, which encompasses Central Southern San Fernando Valley. Um, are there any folks from the San Fernando Valley here? Please put in the chat. 
Um, he was a founding member of the Generation Next mentorship program and created the Cal Kids program, a college savings account to pay for the college or career training expenses. Um, so assembly member, um, feel free to come on. I'm here. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Wow, I'm just looking at all everyone that's responding. Sherman Oaks, Van Nuys, fantastic. And Canoga Park, where I actually grew up. I grew up in Winnetka, uh, which is the West San Fernando Valley area. Pacoima as well now, fantastic. Um, my, my presentation is very brief. Uh, who says the state doesn't screw up and mess up sometimes? So basically, you know, uh, because of uh, uh, what was said just previously, that there was some language that was uh, a bit uh, 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 not very clear, and also uh, language that forced some things to happen in the bill that would, the previous bill, 506, that would have uh, made it very difficult for many of the organizations to comply. It's critical that we take steps to protect our youth. In fact, I had a lot of trepidation in how exactly we went about doing this bill so that it would be careful in not compromising the background checks uh, that are very necessary to protect uh, our, our, our youth. Um, uh, but it was, it, uh, but it was something that needed, uh, to allow time for organizations to be able to address and deal with. Uh, and also since some of the systems that we had had in place previously of having a single mentor, uh, work with a mentee had worked very well. Uh, we needed to allow certain flexibilities for organizations to continue operating the way that they did before. So uh, wonderful to see so many participants. Uh, and uh, how about if I just keep it brief and say thank you for the opportunity to work and partner with you. Uh, I also can't believe how 10 years went by so quickly being in the legislature, but uh, with wonderful partners such as yourself, I, I, I'm really blessed at the opportunities I've had to make an impact. So thank you. Thanks for allowing me to work on this with you as well. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Beautiful. Thank you, assembly member. So next we're going to highlight Fred Harrington. Um, so Fred Harrington is a paralegal and policy <clears throat> analyst with Nonprofit Insurance Alliance. He attended the Ohio State University and the University of Wisconsin. I don't know if there are any alum from any of those universities. And he lives in the greater Los Angeles area. So Fred, um, we're excited to hear from you. All right, thank you so much, Soleil. Uh, so as Soleil mentioned, I am Fred Harrington. I'm a paralegal and policy analyst for Nonprofits Insurance Alliance. In California, we're known as Nonprofits Insurance Alliance of California. A disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. This does not constitute legal advice. And for specific legal advice, you should consult your organization's own legal counsel. Nonprofits Insurance Alliance is a unique insurance company to provide an insurance perspective on Assembly Bill 506. Nonprofits Insurance Alliance is a 501c3 nonprofit ourselves, just like you. We're owned and governed by our 501c3 nonprofit members. We're based in California and our very success as an organization shows the power of nonprofits working together. Our sole purpose is to serve other nonprofits. So our perspective may be different than commercial insurers. Nonprofits Insurance Alliance was created to address the liability insurance crisis in the mid 1980s when commercial insurers were refusing to offer affordable liability insurance to many nonprofits. Our goal is to help nonprofits to be able to continue to do the important work you all do. So if we are not your insurer, you should also directly ask your insurer their expectations regarding AB 506. So let's look at the slide on an insurance perspective. So this is the part of AB 506 that ties it into insurance. Before writing liability insurance for a youth service organization in this state, an insurer may request information 
demonstrating compliance with this section from the youth service organization as a part of the insurer's loss control program. So because of this tying the bill into insurance, then we've gotten key questions from nonprofits, such as how do we show compliance with AB 506? And is our insurance at risk if we haven't completed compliance with AB 506? AB 506 has not directly affected what we do or what we ask of our members at Nonprofits Insurance Alliance. So we do not specifically look at or ask about compliance with AB 506. We like that AB 506 has a goal of helping to protect children from harm, which aligns with our own goals. Nonprofits Insurance Alliance has always worked with our members to reduce risk to children. We think there are many possible ways to help keep children safe and reduce risk of harm. And we take a comprehensive approach. So let's take mandated reporters. So as Kristen said, then mandated reporters are part of AB 506. And we are very much in support of a bill like AB 506 requiring all youth service organizations to have proper training, supervision, and policies for employees and volunteers who work with children to help protect children. We have always required this of our members. We don't specifically ask about mandated reporters. It's not just about checking a box. Rather, we work with applicants and members brokers to really try to understand your policies and procedures for keeping children safe. We ask about the kind of settings children will be in and what policies and procedures are in place to minimize risk and help keep children safe. We ask about supervision and oversight. We ask about child abuse identification training and reporting policies and procedures. And we offer our members free access to Presidium's abuse prevention training, model policies and procedures, assessment tools, and helpline. Take background checks. AB 506 also requires background checks. We are very much in support of a bill like AB 506 requiring all youth service organizations to do background screening for employees and volunteers to help protect children. We have always required this for our members. It is very important to us from a child safety and risk perspective that our members do thorough background screening for employees and volunteers. But we do not necessarily require fingerprint-based background checks as AB 506 does. Rather, we've always required comprehensive background checks from a reputable service. Personal information-based screening is typically sufficient from a safety and risk mitigation standpoint if from a reputable service and very comprehensive. And these can sometimes be more comprehensive than fingerprint-based background checks. What is important to us is that the background checks include comprehensive nationwide and federal record searches. So returning back to the questions on the slide, key questions from nonprofits. How do we show compliance with AB 506? Is our insurance at risk if we haven't completed compliance with AB 506? Keep in mind the distinction between requirements to get insurance coverage and requirements to fully follow California law. AB 506 wording gives insurers the option of requesting information demonstrating compliance with these particular legal requirements as part of their own insurance requirements, but insurers do not have to do so. So you should check with your own insurer. At Nonprofits Insurance Alliance, we certainly encourage all of our members to fully follow all California laws, including AB 506. And we fully support anything that helps protect children from harm. We are always looking at legal changes and re-examining whether our own requirements should change. The law is never settled. Changing 
as well as being reinterpreted by courts. Our goal is to write insurance in a way that helps us protect children and continue to underwrite and protect our many members so they can deliver their important services. So at this point, AB 506 itself has not affected our own requirements for how and whether to insure our existing and potential nonprofit members. We have always only insured if best practices are in place for child safety policies and procedures, child abuse identification and reporting policies and procedures, and reputable comprehensive background checks. We work with our members to help ensure best practices are in place and followed in order to help protect children. So that at least is our perspective as an insurer whose sole focus is helping nonprofits to continue to do their important work. Over to you, Teresa. Thanks, Fred. And thank you, Fred. So I'd love to introduce Teresa. Teresa was appointed Chief Executive Officer of the Girl Scouts of Greater Los Angeles in September of 2019. As CEO, Teresa provides direction and vision for the development and achievement of the organization's missions to build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. If you were a Girl Scout, put it in the chat box. I know I was. Um, prior to the Girl Scout, she was the VP of Strategic Planning and Change Management in the President's Office of Fuller Seminary. Um, simultaneously, she served as the Executive Director for the Thrive Center for Human Development, among many other things. Um, she's wonderful. So, Teresa, I hand it over to you. Thanks, Soleil. That just means I'm old because there's so <laughs> many credits on that slide. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. <clears throat> and thanks for inviting me into the conversation. Um, the One of the biggest challenges with AB 506 for the eight California Girl Scout Councils was the requirement that our employees and volunteers receive the live scan background checks. You heard um, reference to that. Um, that is at a designated place for fingerprinting. And it required them to be um, complete, to have this completed the day the bill took effect, which was January of this year. Um, so when you look at that and combine it with the fact that in, uh, we have 68,000 volunteers and over 1,200 staff, there was no way we were going to be compliant uh, by that deadline. Um, and in addition to that, we have what I call a decentralized volunteer model, which means our volunteers are spread out um, within the large geographic territory for each council. Um, you can see on the map the eight California councils. <clears throat> it, there's also Southern Nevada and Arizona on this map, but this obviously doesn't affect them, at least not now. Um, you have heard that what happens in California, so goes the rest of the nation. So I'm expecting the same kind of um, requirements to happen across the nation. But it was a daunting task to think about getting everybody done um, and in that time frame. Uh, so what uh, the eight uh, California CEOs came together, the Girl Scout CEOs, um, and we hired a governmental advocate uh, who helped us plead our case with Assemblymember Nazarian. Uh, uh, we, uh, we asked for an amendment to an existing bill, AB 2669, to delay the life scan requirement for one year. Um, give us time to set this up, administrate it. <clears throat> but I'm pleased to report that Governor Newsom signed AB 2669 into law. Um, and this will delay that life scan implementation until December 31st of 2023. So all of us, for all nonprofits that have to comply with this, we have another year to get this done. So we have breathing room to comply. Um, I can't thank Assemblymember uh, Nazarian enough for listening to our concerns and really holding our hand through this process. Um, we are obviously a youth serving organization and believe that all adults have a responsibility to protect kids. Um, we just need to be able to implement some of these safeguards in a reasonable amount of time. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Teresa, for going over a case example of the Girl Scouts. Um, so the next part that we're going to go through, um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. We will go over that and who will take over um, as a part of the committee. And Natana Cabanas is VP of Strategic Partnerships for LA Works. And then Lauren Kay is Director of Communications and Marketing for Cal Nonprofits. So they're going to come on screen and then start discussing some of the questions that came about and um, you know, pick on some of our speakers to help answer these questions. So Natana and Lauren. Yeah, hi, thank you so much everyone for coming today. Um, really appreciate everybody's um, interest and questions. There are a lot of questions coming up today. So I really hope to get to kind of the big ones that seem to be very similar. And the first one that's coming up is around this, what is the definition of a youth serving organization? And so when does this apply to your specific nonprofit and your specific organization? And when does it not? Um, that's sort of the biggest um, grouping. And so I'd like to actually um, ask Kristen if she might be able to take that question and, and sort of try to define when is a youth serving when are you a youth serving organization? Are you a youth serving organization, even if you only do this section of youth service? Any sort of clarity you can provide would be wonderful. Sure. Um, like I mentioned, you, you know, the actual definition provided in AB 506 is very circular. Um, so it, it's really up to interpretation. Uh, best practice in this situation, because it is not clear, is to, to have a broad interpretation of what it is saying. So a broad interpretation of the definition provided in AB 506 would imply that any organization, any youth organization that primarily provides services to minors would be considered a youth service organization. So we're talking about, you know, that that's the primary purpose is providing youth services. And there are employees or, you know, mandated reporters and administrators, employees that are overseeing the services provided by the organization. Um, and that's basically interpreting the definition, um, you know, on its face in, in the broadest sense. Thank you. Lauren, do you want to ask the next question? Sure. Yeah, I've been capturing a bunch. There's a number of questions about um, when parents are working, um, are involved as volunteers. So there's a question about um, some of our parents are volunteers. Do they have to complete the mandated reporter training? Um, does this apply to booster organizations for sports and bands? If the school district volunteer, um, volunteer registration is part of the process, does that suffice, even if it doesn't require fingerprinting? What about youth um, sports? Sorry, I can't read my writing, but that's those are some of the questions about sports. If um, oh, also if parents are present during a program that um, involves children, but the parents are always there, does that does it five oh six apply? I'm not sure who is the best person to answer those questions. Anybody want to take those on? Um, I, I can jump in on when parents are present. <clears throat> if 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 you're using parents as volunteers to um, not watch kids other or be involved in uh, the implementation of your program beyond their own children, then yes, they need to take the training. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, if, if a parent, if it's just a parent and their own kid, um, then it's not necessary. Great. Um, and then I can, I can address Lauren, you had mentioned, you know, organizations that work with other youth serving organizations, would they be required to follow the, um, the requirements as well? If the, if the organization themselves is a youth serving organization, they are required to follow the rules. So it depends on if the, the actual organization is providing services to the, to youth. If it's a booster club, that's not specifically providing services to, to minors, then they might not, they might not be required 
but if they themselves are providing services, then I would argue that they would probably be a youth serving organization. And then if they meet the other requirements um, of the the, the uh, bill, then they would also be required to implement the procedures. So just because the organization that they're working hand in hand with is conducting a background check doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have to conduct a background check themselves. It all depends on whether or not they themselves could be defined as a youth service organization. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a question around, um, and before I actually even ask that, I just want to say, I know I want to recognize the tension that some of this doesn't seem as clear as, as we want it to be. That's why we're hosting this webinar. We felt the same way and we're trying to provide clarity, but um, we want to acknowledge that we are providing as much clarity as, as, as we have. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that tension, but um, I did, there was a question around what, how much time does a volunteer have work with youth for when this would kick in? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to. I'm going to kick it to Kristen again and see if she can answer that question. Sorry to pick on you. Yeah. So for volunteers, it only applies to volunteers that are 18 years or older. I did see some questions about if you have, you know, high school volunteers, they wouldn't, they wouldn't fall under um, the requirement, but uh, any volunteer that is 18 years of age or older that works either or either 16 hours in any given month or 32 hours in the entire year would be considered a regular volunteer and would be required to undergo the background check and to um, complete the mandatory training. Thank okay. you. Um, I, I, sorry, I, to clarify, I don't think I said this, but they have to be working with or supervising children. So if you have an administrative volunteer that has no contact with children, then it would not apply to that volunteer. I think there were a lot of questions related to that. So hopefully everybody who asked those about the administrator working with um, directly. That doesn't with apply to employees that. though. All employees are required to undergo a background check and um, undergo the training. Doesn't specify that employees have to have that contact with children. Good, good to know. Cause that was also asked quite a bit. Um, I have a question here. Our organization is structured around one-on-one -on -one mentoring with over 125 children. How are we supposed to restructure our organization to make sure each child gets two mentors? They meet six hours a month for a minimum of one year. Anybody want to take that one on? Yeah, so, so the good news here is that one-on-one -on -one mentoring is not included in this. And that was one of the exceptions. Um, one of the exceptions that was included in that 2669 follow-up <clears throat> bill, um, because obviously that is a different structure uh, than other youth serving organizations. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna tack onto that question and ask Teresa to repeat when, um, when are we um, expected to be in compliance with um, this background check. In, in other words, can you explain a little bit more about what that AP 2699 has done? Yes, so uh, basically it has um, delayed the requirement for um, compliance until December 31st of 2023. So this way you can begin to put a plan together about how you're going to uh, get compliant and you now have some time to um, think about it. And the way we're approaching it is we're phasing it in because they're just, we have so many volunteers. So we are taking, you know, all of our staff are going first and along with our volunteers that are that fall in that most frequent category. And then we'll take a set, another tranche and another tranche and another tranche after that. So that's our approach. I have a question. I've seen a couple of questions related to the process itself. Like what are the, how do you obtain the forms that are needed when you go to do fingerprinting? Um, I see one, how does an organization get access to administer live scans and receive results? So can anybody speak to that overall practice and the process involved? Yes, you have to get a number from the DOJ. So the first thing you need to do is someone um, 
in your organization should be appointed to be the point person on all of this because it is bureaucratic, right? Big surprise. Um, and so you need to reach out to the DOJ so that your organization gets a specific number. And what will happen is when your volunteers go to get their fingerprint, that will be credited to your unique special DOJ number. And then the DOJ will send you the reports on the finger, um, you know, the, the, the fingerprint and the background check. So any red flags come up, it'll go to you. But you need to designate someone in your organization to be the eyes on that um, and probably to do a lot of the uh, beginning, um, you know, paperwork and setting yourself up. It probably shouldn't be a, you know, organization-wide um, um, you know, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, you know, for for being able to read the results, you need to protect privacy. So, um, you know, this is something you have to build in to your organization. And for some of us, for us, it's a full time new position, right? Uh, because we have so many volunteers, and you have to track it. And if somebody <clears throat> falls off as no longer a volunteer, you are obligated by law to take that off of your um, information. So it is a monitor, it is definitely closely monitoring. <clears throat> and do you have to do live scans each year on the same volunteer? No, once you've live scanned to your, to your DOJ number, it is good for life. The, the problem is, and this is what, what drives me crazy, is many people are already fingerprinted because they're teachers or doctors or, you know, I, I'm fingerprinted for other work that I do, but it doesn't count for Girl Scouts. I needed to get a um, unique, you know, so now I have to go get fingerprinted again, which, which I've done, but, you know, that's kind of a, a pain for those volunteers who, you know, already are fingerprinted. They'll say to you, but I'm, I'm fingerprinted, I, you know. But unfortunately, the DOJ doesn't sync up like that. They won't share that information. And there is an association number attached to your organization when you do fingerprinting. So in case a volunteer commits a crime, um, you will get notification through that associated yeah. number. And I will share with you that one of our Girl Scout councils in sort of central California, <clears throat> they're a little bit smaller, and they actually signed up to do life scan as a service to the community, and they actually get money from that, right? So not only is it, are they uh, charging the life scan fee, they are also charging a fee to administer it. So they actually are drawing revenue off of it. Um, it's a bit complicated. Um, but you can also apply to become a live scan spot. How do you do that? I heard that that was asked. It's through the DOJ. You just, everything, everything on this is through the DOJ. Okay. More on live scans. They cost money, right? So yep. are organizations covering that cost or does the volunteer cover the cost? That's up to you. You know, I mean, this is the problem. It is expensive. Life scan, we, we estimated around 60, you know, dollars a person. It's like we're in for $5 million, you know, with if the eight California councils, the cost to us is, is almost $5 million. So it's, it can be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a, a few questions around, well, what if an, another organization um, live scans or is background checked? Is background checking the volunteer? Or what if a parent is in the room? Or what if the staff is in the, like if there's an accompaniment, um, would this law apply to those volunteers if someone in, in the room is covered and there, it's an accompaniment? You know, that is an interesting question and a little bit of a gray area. So for instance, if you have vendors coming in and out or subject matter experts that are coming to, um, you know, demonstrate something or work with the kids and you have, you know, people on staff that are, um, you know, live, have been live scanned, then 
no, they don't, you know, the, 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 the person, the subject matter expert or the person coming in on a, um, not a regular basis wouldn't have to, um, but anyone that's going to be working with the youth, um, on a regular basis needs to go through the training and get the life scan. Even if there's a parent in the room. The parent is only applicable to their own kid. So that parent can't be the eye, can't, cannot be responsible for all the kids, right? It's their own kid. Um, and so, and remember the little known fact, most abuse happens from people that know your child. They're not stranger. We always talk about stranger danger. That is a tiny percentage. Um, it, it, it is mostly people known to the kid and the family. So, you know, parent in the room only applies to your own child. Thank you. I want to actually ask Fred a question around compliance and um, this, this question of who, who is the authority of making sure that that said nonprofit is in compliance and what happens when that said nonprofit is not in compliance? Yeah, uh, good question. So um, I think this is, part of this is gonna be maybe better for Kristen, but I think that the bill is is pretty ambiguous, if not silent on, on consequences. But what it does say, and this is how insurance comes in and why I'm being asked is, is that it does say that insurers can request um, information demonstrating compliance with this before issuing insurance. But back to, back to what I said before, at least from my own organization's perspective, is that we, have, we do not directly ask people for compliance for AB 506 when considering whether and how to insure them. We do have things that are very similar. We always have. So we've always asked for looking at what are the policies and procedures in place? And are you doing a reputable, comprehensive, nationwide, including federal level background checks? So this is very similar to the things that AB 506 is aimed at. But at least our own perspective is that we don't directly look at AB 506, at least not at this point. Other insurers may. And if you want me to add to that, um, Fred is correct in saying that there is no actual compliance written into EB 506. Um, but just to let everyone know of the consequences, um, mandated reporters are required to report um, abuse. And if they don't do so, then they could be open to criminal or civil penalties. Um, so you want to make sure that your employees and administrators are properly trained so that they're aware that they need to be reporting um, these um, abuses. And then also, if your organization is involved in a lawsuit, um, likely the first thing they're going to look at is your policies and procedures and make sure that you were in compliance with AB 506. Um, so in addition to, you know, possibly whatever your insurance requires, um, you might want to consider that um, when you're lo looking into making sure you have the proper policies and procedures in place. Um, I just, I want to recognize we have a couple more slides to go, but I, I want to ask a couple questions that keep coming up. This question on what happens if it's an online volunteer? Does that matter? Is that relevant? Yes. Meaning they have to still comply with this law. If they're interacting with children on a regular basis, yes. Okay. That's a definitive answer. Thank you. And then this next question is around training. How often do does the training happen? Is there a resource for where we can see the training? Um, any Any clarity on the training would be great. Yeah, there is an online resource for training. Um, and I think I mentioned it, but it was, um, let me get you the exact name of the, the, the site. It's through the, um, the Office of Child Abuse Prevention in the State Department of Social Services. So if you go to the California website, you can find the training um, through, that, through that website. 
Um, and the amount of training is not specified in the AB 506. So the training is required, but it doesn't specify how often you need to complete the training. Um, if you need to renew the training, it does not specify any of that. Um, Teresa might have a better idea of, of what, what might be best in practice, but it would be your internal organization's policies and procedures determining how often you want your own individuals to complete the training. Lauren, did you see any? Yeah, did you see? Any? Uh, you know, I'm not seeing. Uh, let me see if I can paraphrase. It was somebody was asking what, and I don't know if this is too repetitive, but what constitutes an employee? Um, somebody was saying that they um, pay youth interns. Um, they pay them. I guess it's like a stipend, or they are on payroll. Do they also need to be? Um, are they mandate? Do they have to go through the training and live scanning? Um, if they're considered employees, um, that's more of an employment law question. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. If they're an employee, though, they would need to be um, going through the training. Are they over 18? Are they asking are, for people over 18 or, or are they are paying um, kids under 18? They were not under 18. I'm looking for the question, but I'm not seeing so it. 18 and over. If you are, you know, if you are you know, serving youth, connecting with youth, then you have, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Regardless of you, if you're an intern or, because you're, you, you are liable for their actions. Right. And there's another question, 18, we have youth 18 to 21 in our program. They're not, they don't have super supervisory responsibility, but they participate. Do they need to be fingerprinted and trained? It would depend on if they're employees or volunteers. So if they were employees, they would need to be fingerprinted and trained. If they were volunteers, only if they work, you know, the, the specified number of hours and if they have direct contact with or supervision of children. Yeah, it sounds like they participate in the program. If they're receiving services from the program and they're over 18, then they're not a, considered a youth, right? So... Right. Um, but are they interacting? I, you know, it's, it's, this is where there's such a gray area, but you have to think about what are your best practices going to be, right? Good point. Really good point. There were a number, I don't know if we have more time. There were a number of, a couple of questions about the penal code that is mentioned. Oh, Soleil's. One more minute. Mm, okay. And also something about whether the recent California ruling saying that um, date of birth cannot be included in public criminal records, does that have an impact on AB 506? What was the, the question about the penal code? Did they want to know what the site was or? Yes, they wanted to know what the penal code cited was. And then also whether this recent ruling um, about not being able to include date of birth in public criminal records. I'm not familiar with this. And how would that have an impact. I, I'm not sure about that, um, but the penal code section that I did reference regarding background checks, this is the requirement for a background check, um, is 11105.3. Um, so that's the California Penal Code section 11105.3. 11105.3. Whoops. I went to direct message. And then um, I don't know if I actually cited this penal code section, but the, the section regarding mandated reporters, that's also an important section. Um, and that is 11165.7. So that discusses who is considered a mandated reporter. So um, I just wanted to wrap up the question and answer. I know there's a ton of questions out there. Um, and I know that we just scratched the surface of helping provide some clarity. Um, I do want to let you guys know, again, this is being recorded. We will send this out as well as the law itself, which actually defines as clear as the law has what you serving organizations are. Um, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge that this was really just a, a very uh, rough surface. Um, and if you have further questions, um, I, I really encourage you to ask those questions to people who are um, making these decisions. So, um, so thank you. With that, I'm handing it back to Soleil.
Thank you, Tina, Tana, and Lauren for navigating all those questions. And again, we all got together as a committee, as volunteers to figure it out as we try to implement it at our own organization. So um, we are taking note, recording this session, and also we will download all the questions and um, hopefully um, have capacity. Maybe we'll get Kristen's support on answering some of the questions that we weren't able to. Um, so we're almost done with this presentation. So in terms of next steps, what support do nonprofits need and what do nonprofits need to support? Um, enter in the chat what you need help with. And we're also going to launch a poll as well. Um, Carsey, if you can help with that. So after this presentation, how confident do you feel about AB 506? And so we'll try to get about 90% participation. We are almost there. We're getting there. We're at 60%. And again, this is anonymous, so feel free to answer truthfully. There have been a lot of questions. Um, and for some of you at the beginning, we did mention that uh, a large percentage didn't know about this. So again, we are at 82%. Let's try to get to 90. And thank you for putting things in the chat as well. I think we're almost done. Okay, if you want to put in your last uh, final answer. Okay, Carsey, we can end the poll. You can share the results. Okay, so 45% of you said, I know more, but still have a lot of questions. Completely fair. And the next segment is 24%. I know a little more about it and can explore more probably on my own. Um, Carsey, you can stop sharing. Thank you. So the next thing I do want to highlight is finding support near you. I'm not sure how many folks are attached or attend different uh, professional associations rooted in volunteer engagement, um, but we do have Dovia LA and the larger Dovia organization. LA Works has been a huge um, supporter, at least in the work that I do as a volunteer administrator. Uh, Californians for All is another, um, they do like monthly calls. We do have Volunteer LA with the city, um, Alive Association of Leaders and Volunteer Engagement, Points of Light in the CCVA. So please feel free to um, reach out or join any of these organizations. And then we have um, a little pitch on an upcoming. Um... Yeah, thank you. I, you know, there's so much on this bill that's so questionable. I'm sure everybody's feeling a little bit overwhelmed, um, but I wanted to just speak about another opportunity for us to connect, especially for um, volunteer engagement professionals. I'm the president of Dovia LA and we are, Southern California host site for a big volunteer management conference that this year is going to um, focus on data and impact and storytelling. We will be hosting for the first time in a very long time in person for the LA area participants and Dovia Sacramento will be hosting virtually. The links are shown there. You can also email us at doviala at gmail.com if you have questions. Love to have you get involved. Thank you so much, Soleil. Thank you, Kate. And she has been super helpful in the work, especially as a volunteer administrator. So please come join us, any LA folks. Um, and if you're a part of Adovia in other parts of California, uh, put it in the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. But otherwise, thank you so much for attending this presentation. We will share all the questions and concerns um, today with Sacramento. Um, again, we formed this committee because uh, we had no idea how to implement and move forward. So again, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing if any of the other presenters would like to say anything before we end this call. And I will spotlight folks. I just want to say that this is this webinar came about because people reached out in the nonprofit space to help one another. And I just love the collective power of that. So I say we we keep uh, staying in touch with one another about how we can help 
each other because um, we're all doing good for youth. I also want to give a huge shout out to Soleil, who actually was the one that pulled this group together from the beginning, um, just because we were all we were all in the same boat with you guys. We're we're trying to make our way this way as well. So um, I really want to acknowledge all your work as well as Teresa was saying. So um, thank you so much, and thank you, Soleil, for letting ha making this webinar happen. Yeah, thanks to all our partners. It's always important when something's impacting the nonprofit sector in the way that this is. Um, clearly, the kind of response that we had to this um, let us know that uh, this was something that was needed and probably more information will be needed um, as we move forward. So thank you so much for joining and thanks to everybody here um, on this effort. And as a reminder, I will send this out to you all within a week. Granted, Technology didn't fail me. We've been in the <laughs> Zoom world for quite some time, so you never know. Um, but thank you all again. And we will stay on in case um, anything else comes about. But we will close this at exactly 1 p.m. because we all have our respective jobs to do.